everybody. Julia asked me if I would record um, some lessons learned from teaching online in COVID times. And so I thought I would start with a short slide presentation I put together um, for peers before COVID started around creating online learning communities and what I've learned about trying to do that during COVID, why it matters still, maybe why it matters more, and what some of the challenges can be. So this is just the beginning of how you go about doing it, uh, or one way. And this is pulled from literature that I reviewed several years ago when I was first starting some online teaching um, and trying to hone my practice a little bit. So the first thing is to make sure that the groups are reasonably small, that they're conversational in size, about five to six members per group. And I set up groups just by creating new topics in my forum discussions and adding student names to them and telling them to find their name. I also, again, because the intent is to make it conversational, get them to limit their posts, uh, 50 to 75 words, maybe 100, um, and it's very good practice for them to edit down as well. I try to have only a limited number of questions each week, ideally two, never more than three. If I have something really critical that needs more than three questions, I'll probably give them a choice of doing A or B part of a question. The students have appreciated and let me know that they appreciate moving the groups around week to week. So I don't do that every week, but from time to time, I'll look at the statistics function in Sakai and I will rebalance the group so that one group doesn't happen to end up with all the people who are frequent posters and another with ones that are maybe less engaged online. Um, so typically I try to leave the groups um, static for about three weeks and then switch them up. But as I say, I will rebalance them if I notice they're out of whack and have some time off. If this is one thing I've really learned this term is the students need it and I need it as well, that there should be posting free weeks. That doesn't mean the students aren't doing anything. They could still have readings that they're responsible for. They will probably have other tasks. I tend to pop those weeks into the course just before there's a major assignment due when I know they're going to be working on it. And I'll tell the students that during that week, um, I'm more available for online meetings, um, you know, email responses, looking at drafts of their work, that kind of thing. Uh, but do think about the load. It doesn't make sense to nag students for not engaging in the online discussion when they're really just busy doing other things. You'll see in lots of places the importance of instructor presence, but I think it's worth going back to some foundational resources around what does that actually mean online? Because it doesn't mean being online all the time, and it absolutely does not mean responding to every student comment. If your intention is to try and create student communities, it's really critical to get the students talking to each other, not just to us. Um, so present, but not omnipresent, as they say. And I'm sure you're familiar with the phrase of being a guide on the side rather than a, a sage on the stage. That doesn't mean you can't lecture. Absolutely, you can lecture. Um, certainly recommend doing a flipped classroom approach where the lectures are recorded in short bites. Uh, if you have half an hour worth of lecture material, I strongly suggest considering breaking it down into five or six mini lectures so that the students can watch what to them is probably a bite-sized chunk. Um, and I have found it helps me chunking the information that I'm trying to present anyway. Um, so really what I would do is things like the first person who posts in a thread, they want to know somebody's listening to them. I often say something like, thanks so much for starting things off, or that's really interesting. Let's see what others say about it. What I'm trying to do is invite others into it so that we don't end up with a keener who's just having a one-way conversation with me. I'm learning a lot about wait time. Um, wait time during COVID for asynchronous discussion is longer. People get diverted by lots of other things and you probably experience this by just not having the emotional capacity to do the work at times. I certainly know I have felt that way. I've also learned that when I do my synchronous virtual meetings, which I put in a few times during the term, the wait time if I pose a question to a virtual group is phenomenally longer than in-person in class. That's just an aside, but it's worth thinking about.
Jilly Salmon is my go-to guru about online learning. I have learned so much from her really accessible writing about um, e-tivities, you know, activities to get students engaged, e-moderating. Um, she has a website. You can get snippets from that, but I recommend her books as well. They're really good reads. Um, so the key that she would say, get, get people on there, get them interested in participating. Motivation in the online space is about the personal connection. So once the students feel like they're connected to each other and they're getting useful comments from their peers, um, I don't need to nag them to participate. They kind of keep going with that. So I usually run a scavenger hunt in the first week um, and it's really just to get to know each other, get to know the site. I'll have them do things like um, make sure they've uploaded a, a photo or an image of their choice to their profile. Um, head on over to the chat room and post, uh, you know, in our in our department, it would be an APA tip so that they've got a resource place to go back to and have them respond to a couple of questions. I usually have a fairly short reading the first week so that the focus is really on getting them online with low stakes and getting them talking to each other. So sharing some uh, comments about why they're there. Um, finding something they don't like on the syllabus, uh, those kinds of things, just to get them uh, on each other's side, so to speak, um, and getting them to talk a little bit about who they are so that they're able to build a more three-dimensional self for their peers because the tiny, tiny little profile picture doesn't go very far. Certainly invite them to upload a short video if they like, or um, this term I had a lot of students doing very short, but audio recordings of how to pronounce their name. Um, anything that helps them connect in a richer and more multi-dimensional way with each other. And then information exchange. Um, one of the things I found really successful is having them go and comb the web for resources. So if the course is fairly um, peer-reviewed journal-based or text-based, having them go and find ancillary resources in the form of uh, short web, um, short videos or websites, or sometimes I'll say go find a cartoon that pertains to this week's reading. And so the sharing of that kind of stuff and commenting on each other's, I tend to see the connections getting really well established with that. Have them, when you can, work on things together. And I don't mean big work, and that's been my huge COVID learning. People don't have the capacity to do big group projects. I'm really finding that that's not gone as well this term as it has in the past. Um, but miniature things together in the forums tends to work really, really well. So it might be post your response to this. Now look at how your peers within your group, how their responses are the same or different. Or everybody contribute three words and then construct a word cloud or a, a graphic of some kind at the end or put your ideas into a Venn diagram. And they're pretty fast to find the um, free online sites where they can do that and, and share a link. Um, and have them reflect on what they're learning. So it helps them communicate who they are to their peers. It helps everybody compare what their uh, perspectives are on the readings and materials with each other's. And it just seems to carry the course that little bit higher. So here's the, the one-stop shopping page for what to do to get some online communities going. Um, send them a welcome email. I know they get lots of emails and I know the Sakai site has all the information on it, um, but the intention is to set a personal tone up front. And I would make that as um, conversational and light an email as possible. I'm sure it'll have important information, but I think, again, establishing a personal connection is really good. I usually drop in a paragraph about what my background is. I often invite them to send me questions and notes about themselves that they may or may not post to their peers. Um, ask them to upload a photograph, get this uh, scavenger hunt or something like that, some activities that are more around the process of being an online student. Get that going up front. We can't assume that our students know how to make this work. And along that line, even giving them a template to say, here's a template for filling out your notes about reading the first article. Because one of the things that um, has been suggested recently is the students don't have good online note taking skills. When they're in a class, they can see each other taking notes and they tend to do a little peer modeling. When they're online, they really are doing that aspect in isolation. So a little bit of support is a great idea. 
Um, and then they can share that as one thing in the forums. Uh, they could share a writing tip, anything that lets them feel they are contributing, um, regardless of what I'm teaching. Usually at some point in the term, fairly early on, I will have them share how they're coping with COVID and their mental well-being. Um, and it's a place that I can upload some links to Brock resources as well. Pose questions that require group discussion. Um, we all have great questions. A lot of them one person can answer by themselves. And if we're trying to create online learning communities, we want them talking to each other. So whatever they can do as a group or requires them to um, compare and contrast amongst the group members is really, really helpful. And then I know my lovely smiling face is blocking out the last point, but it's building in frequent reflection on what's happening and uh, uh, metacognitive moments about the process, what they're getting from each other, doesn't hurt to ask them to pick up on a peer's point and contribute to it. I'm not saying this will make everything happen, but these are sort of the steps that go towards creating a group a situation in Sakai where instead of the students saying, as we've seen from some recently reported surveys, that online learning doesn't work, I have students saying, this is awesome. I never knew it could be this good. Good luck with everything. <laughs>